Good morning. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Impossible ever stopped you. Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty too. Since the wind has impossible ever stopped you. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. Yeah, Pentecostal fire, stirring something new. You're not going to run out of miracles anytime soon. Yeah, resurrection power runs in my veins too. I believe there's another miracle here in this room. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave. together my God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to just ask the man who was sown on the bones of Elijah if there's anything that he can't do just ask the stone that was rolled at the tomb Welcome this morning, whether you're joining us online or in person, we welcome you all the same. We are so excited to be together to praise our risen Savior. Amen, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, good morning.
As you make your way back to your seat, I ask that you continue to stand. Lift your voice and sing with me. sing that refrain one more time when the veil when the veil was torn my sin was forgiven who could ask for more than this with arms open wide you bled and died my heart was reborn
and amen. You may be seated. At this time, um, I'm going to ask that our ushers come forward and take up our offering baskets. We have many ways to give. Uh, you can give online or you can give in person. And as a few maybe come forward to take up the baskets. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs> Let us continue to enter into a time of worship. storms made way for spring in every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life thank you Jesus I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, but fear will leave. to victory you are my strength and you always will be I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see I see I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin is rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin is rolled away. Because of you, oh Jesus. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life all over my life so why should i fear oh the evidence is clear why should i fear oh the Let's lift our voices with that chorus again, please. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Why should I so I? Should I fear? Oh, the evidence is clear. Why should I fear? Oh, the evidence is clear. One more time. 
let's lift our voices. Why should I fear Oh, the evidence is clear. Why should I fear? Oh, the evidence is clear. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly God, we come, we come to you this morning and just so thankful and so grateful. God, we come just giving you everything that we're worried about. God, each and every one of us have stress. We have things that we want to give over to you. And God, let this serve as our reminder this morning that you are so capable and you are so mighty. If we would only just let go. Just as we sang, why should I fear? Your evidence in our lives is so clear, Lord. And we pray that your Holy Spirit fill this place as we are about to receive the message. Help us take these things as we go out this week. Help us remember your goodness and share your love to every person we meet. Thank you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. He is risen. He is risen. Three small words that brought the collective pace of humanity to an absolute standstill. He is risen. Three words that shattered prisons. Words that shook the earth's foundations. Words that transformed a sense of utter despair into cries of pure joy and ecstasy. Echoes of history's greatest triumph that still shape our reality. There is nothing that Jesus cannot overcome. We know this because he lives. We know this because he is risen. Good morning. It's great to see everybody. Thank you for showing up. Uh, the Sunday after Easter is often kind of depressing for pastors. Uh, so we... We get to the empty tomb on Easter, and then we have the empty church the week following. But thank you. Thank you for being here, because it's important that we gather in the name of Christ. Uh, and it's important that we continue to tell this story, the story of salvation that is unleashed for the entire world. I'm going to, to read our text for today, and if you are able, I would love to have you stand as we read the gospel of Jesus Christ. This comes to us from John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. So imagine we are back on that Easter Sunday, um, and the people had heard something was going on. They heard from the women, from Mary Magdalene, uh, and here's what happens that afternoon. So, 2019. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails of my hand in his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please be seated? Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds today to this word of yours. Speak to us through that same Holy Spirit that you breathed on your disciples so that we may hear your word. And may it be your word, O oh God, I pray, even through the likes of one such as me. In Jesus' name, amen. You ever notice that the Bible did not have a very good PR firm? All right, we're familiar with PR firms. They, they're the people who clean up reputations. They're the people who put out the right story, that craft the right image. Uh, PR firms do this for politicians. They do it for high-powered uh, executives. They do it for actors. It's all about crafting that which you put out to everyone else. You, you sculpt, you, you build, you carefully construct the image that you want others other people to see, right? We're, we're very familiar with that. The Bible doesn't do a very good job of that. Have you ever noticed that? Hey, the Bible tells us stories and, I, and I'm like, are you sure you wanted to tell that one? I mean, think about it. it. Even from the very beginning, you get this guy named Abraham who's called, Abram who's called and uh, Part of it is awesome, right? Man of great faith. That's a good story. We can work with that. Let's build on that. But yet not far into his life, not far into his journey following God, you find him lying. Uh, maybe you remember that. He's going down into Egypt to, to escape a famine. He's going down into Egypt and he comes up against Pharaoh and he has his beautiful wife, Sarah. And he says, hey, tell that guy you're my sister. Yeah, that'll work. Tell him you're my sister. Otherwise, he may kill me and take you from me. All right. You, you, later on, you find Abraham and Sarah, uh, they've been promised a child. Been promised a child to carry on the promises of God. Very important child. Crucial to where this story is supposed to go. Only it's taking time. And they're impatient. It's taking time and they're more impatient until Sarah at last says, hey, look, you need an heir. Tell you what, I'm going to give you my, I'm going to give you Hagar, my handmaiden, have a child by her to be your heir. But completely thwarting what God wanted to do, right? That's not a great story to tell, especially it gets even worse whenever... The child is born, Isaac, of Sarah. They abandon Hagar and Ishmael out into the wilderness. God doesn't abandon them, but Abraham and Sarah do. It, it's an interesting thing. Then you get to how it goes from there. Um, you get Isaac having a couple of, of kids, right? The youngest one being Jacob. Jacob is known as a scoundrel. He, and he's the one who steals the promise from his older brother Esau. The promise to be God's, to form God's people. He tricks him. He scams him. He cons him. Right? Would you tell that story? If you're trying to craft an image, is that the story you would tell? And it goes on and on. I think about King David. Wow, I mean, David, you had so much good stuff to work there from a PR firm, right? You got this young guy who's handsome, he's anointed to be king, he's brave, he can even write poetry and sing. He's like a five-tool player. He's got it all. He goes up against the giant Goliath and just by sheer faith in God, he conquers a giant. Now there's, some, there's a story you can build on. David does become king, and then you remember what happens? In his kingship and his comfort, he strays, finds himself caught up in lust for a woman who's not his wife, sins for her, takes her, has a child by her. 
Not only does he commit adultery, he then conspires to murder the woman's husband. I don't think I would have told that one either. Those origin stories in faith, they don't, of how our faith began, of how our faith persists, they don't, they don't clean anything up. They just tell what happened. And what happened is, is deeply mired in what it means to be human. It, we see some of the most extraordinary acts of heroism, faithfulness, strength, nobility. But we also see the stories of fear, betrayal, cowardice. But all those things that can be part and parcel of being human, be, of being human are on display. And so when we get to this point in time where last week we celebrated the resurrection and we, you know, bringing out chairs, we shouldn't be surprised that we got plenty of chairs available for everyone. It's just part of our human story for some reason. The resurrection story that we heard today of Thomas, would you have told this one? I mean, if you're trying to craft a narrative of a courageous, faithful church, would you have included this one? I mean, and there, there are other hints in this story that the disciples are struggling. I mean, they're, they're behind locked doors to start with. Did they not hear Jesus had been resurrected, right? Jesus has been resurrected. He had overcome the power of the empire. He had overcome the, all the hurt and harm the religious leaders wanted to heap upon him. He had overcome death itself. That's what they had heard. And that's what some of them had seen and bore witness to. And yet they locked the door. They locked the door. It, it, it tells us that maybe Thomas isn't the only one who's struggling a little bit with how to be faithful in these moments. Of course, Thomas isn't there. I don't know where he was. Maybe you do. Um, maybe he was had to run home and, and, I don't know, get an Amazon order or something. But he wasn't there. Everybody else was. I, I wonder how he felt. I mean, there's a... We've got a new uh, acronym in our world called FOMO, fear of missing out. Anybody suffer from fear of missing out? Uh, uh, I suffer from something else. It's called fear of being invited. That's how you think if you're an extrovert. Fear of missing out. Thomas missed out. Don't know where he was. Don't know what he was doing. But the other 10... They got the memo, right? Ten, because Judas isn't part of that. Judas is out of the picture. Somehow they got the memo. Maybe you know what that feels like. Uh, you, you hear, oh, there was a party. Nobody invited me. Well, we had that meeting. I didn't know about that. Well, we had practice. Well, no one, I didn't see it. There's Thomas. I, I don't know how he felt about not being there, but he starts hearing the reports from his fellow disciples. Hey, he showed up. The women, they, they came to us. Peter and John, they, they ran to the tomb. John outran Peter again. Big surprise. That's an inside Bible thing. I just did that. Those of you who grinned, at least I know you know the gospel stories. Where was I? Why didn't he wait on me? That would have been what I would have been about if I was Thomas. You couldn't have sent for me? No, it's just home waiting on the cable guy again. I don't know where Thomas was, but he missed out. And when he misses out and the others tell him, what does he say? Look, guys... I don't know if they had Saint, uh, if they had April Fool's jokes back then, but that's probably what he feels like. Yeah, right. You're trying to get one over on me. For whatever reason, he does not believe what they say to him. And it's just part of his personality. And we get a glimpse into Thomas's personality in John's gospel. Uh, John is the only one who details Th Thomas in any way, really. And at least gives him words to speak. If you remember in John's gospel, I believe it's about chapter 10, Jesus has gotten word that his friend Lazarus has fallen ill and is going to die. 
Jesus lingers and waits, knowing that Lazarus has died. He's going to wait four days just to show that Lazarus is good and dead, so that this his bringing Lazarus back to life can't be mistaken for a resuscitation. But when he finally says, okay, let's go to Judea. Judea, by the way, was a place in John's gospel that was very hostile towards Jesus where violence most likely awaited Jesus and the disciples. Thomas isn't afraid to go. He goes, let us go. We'll go with you so that we may die with you. That's who Thomas is. Ready to charge into it. But Thomas also wants to know stuff when things aren't clear. Jesus in the farewell discourse The night that he institutes the Lord's Supper, the night before he's betrayed and given over uh, to be tried and then eventually crucified, he's talking to his disciples and he says, look, I am going away. And in my father's house, there are many mansions and I'm, I'm going away to prepare a place and I will bring you to myself. And Thomas goes, wait, how do we get there? How do you get there? Because Jesus says, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas goes, no, I don't know the way. Can you give me the coordinates? Can you give me the address? Can you give me a map? And Jesus says, Thomas, I, I am the way. Not that there's a map, but Jesus himself is the way to the father. So Thomas, when he's not clear on something, he's not afraid to speak up. Um, some, of, some of you know what that's like. Some of you are that way. When you don't know, you're willing to speak up. Uh, I've always tended to be, when I didn't know something, I didn't want to speak up for fear I just look not smart. I mean, I'll just figure it out. I don't need to know all the answers. I'll just figure it out. Which explains my really bad relationship to Ikea furniture. My my father-in-law, he wants to know. He's got it all laid out, so that's why I need him to help me. Otherwise, my marriage to my wife, Marcy, cannot survive me putting together IKEA furniture because I just try to figure it out, and it doesn't always work out well. But Thomas wants to know, how do we get there? That's who Thomas is. And so here again, Thomas speaks up. You know, guys, unless I see, unless I touch... Unless I hear, I need more. I need more. And the remarkable thing is Jesus gives him more. Jesus gives him what he needs. Jesus shows up a week later and we don't know what they did during that week. We just know that a week later they're back in the same place. They're behind closed doors once again. And Jesus shows up to Thomas. Thomas acknowledges him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. So what are we to do with this text? Why does John tell us this story? Well, I think think it's important to see that We're all on our own journey. We all have different ways that we connect, different ways we learn, different ways we experience the world. Some of us believe a little more easily than others. And some of us struggle a little more than others. Some of us are given the gift of, oh yeah, I heard that, therefore I'll believe it. Others of us just really want to chew on it and dig down deep and go, I need need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. I, I think we're also given this story because it's not the only story of doubt in scripture and it's not the only story of doubt in the resurrection narratives. Every one of the resurrection narratives can contain some level of doubt, some level of fear, some level of not knowing what to do with this. I think the early church didn't clean that up with a PR firm because it's part of our origin story. That this idea that doubt and faith, they, they may not be as opposite as we think. That doubt is part of our human existence 
that doubt is present. It's interesting. It is present in every one of the resurrection narratives. In Matthew's gospel, the one that gets me in particular is when they have already gone to Galilee and Jesus is on the mountain and he is ascending back into, into heaven and they fall down and they worship him. But then Matthew adds, but some doubted. I, I get Thomas's doubt. He wasn't there, right? I can understand that doubt. But there they are. They've, they've faithfully gone to Galilee. They're seeing Jesus ascend. And yet some doubted. How can that be? How can that be? And why is that part of our origin story as the church? Well, if we know everything we trust nothing there's an element of faith here to 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 name at least thomas is willing to name that which he doubts so that then he can embrace christ more fully even in the midst of it there, there's something about the way that jesus comes to him right there's something about that jesus doesn't give up on him jesus doesn't look you know and go oh i'm not going over there this sunday I'm not going over there. That, that Thomas guy didn't believe in me, so I'm staying away. I'll show him. That's not who Jesus is. The other thing I admire so much about Thomas, and we call him Doubting Thomas throughout history, and it's kind of a negative moniker. I think we shouldn't do that. Not in a, not in a negative way. Thomas insists on his own personal experience of Jesus he's not going to accept someone else's experience of Jesus. That, that Many of us can fall into that trap of allowing someone else's experience of Jesus be enough for us. And, and what I mean is, you can read a book by a great Christian author. It used to be Billy, Billy Graham books sold millions of copies, and a lot of people would read Billy Graham books, and those are, those are awesome but their experience of Jesus was actually Billy Graham's experience of Jesus. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Or fill in your favorite Christian author. Don't, they'll tell you about their experience of Jesus and those are good things and those are helpful and they help nurture and feed us, but they can never substitute for our own personal relationship with Jesus, our own personal experience of Jesus. Thomas and his uh, stubbornness, and his need to know more was willing to say, I need to have my own experience of the resurrected Lord. There's a tenaciousness to that. He's dogged in that. He doesn't give in to the peer pressure of the other disciples and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe you guys. No, he's, he's honest. And for us to come to the place where we have our own experience of the resurrected Lord. I think more than anything else, God desires our honesty. If you have fear and doubt about whether God's real or not, take that to God. It's okay. God's big enough to handle that. God's big enough to handle that. Take your honesty to God. Take who you are to God and see if God won't be faithful back to you. One of the fascinating things about Thomas is he goes on to be an incredible missionary. He goes on, uh, church history holds that he goes as far as India to spread the good news of Jesus. So many times we leave Thomas in that upper room doubting when we forget that he goes and spreads the gospel of Jesus Christ in strength and in power. He's gifted by God to do that. And my guess is if he hadn't have had that doubt in personality, he never would have gotten there. God's desire is to be close to all of us. God's desire is for us to be open enough, honest enough, transparent enough to say, this is who I am. This is where I am. And the Bible models that for us. So many times we think, oh, I have to get my act together before I go to church. 
I've got to get my act together before I go to a Bible study. I've heard people say over and over again, well, I would come to a Bible study, but I don't know anything about the Bible. Well, that's some great logic there, isn't it? But you know it's true. Well, I don't want to show up and have people find out that I, I don't know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. What, there's two? But to come in honesty, to come and say, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. This is what I believe, this is what I don't believe. Opens the door, even if you try to lock it, for Christ to come. For Christ to come. See, our God, our Lord, our Savior is always coming to us. So, so many times we're like, well, to seek Jesus or go, you need to find Jesus. If we'll but open our hearts and our minds, what we'll experience is that Jesus is already looking for us. Whether we've locked ourselves behind closed doors or whether we've barricaded ourselves behind doubt and cynicism, Jesus always comes to us. And he is relentless in his pursuit of that relationship with us. So I've got a, got a little gift for you all for coming to church today. We're about to be done with church. I want us to pray. I want us to pray in this place this day that we could open up ourselves to where Jesus could really come and be present. Will you join me? Lord, we often, we so often lock the doors or we hide behind our cynicism, our fear, our doubt. We keep you at arm's length. Oh Lord, help us in this room right now to confess to you that which we are putting in your way. The barriers to uh, the depth of relationship that you ask for. Lord, may we unlock those doors and may we, spurred on by the witness of others, insist on having our own relationship with you, our own experience of you. However that needs to look like can be as different as there are individuals in this room. But oh Lord, be present, show up. That's what you are, that's what you do. Lord, help us to hear the same words that you gave to Thomas. Don't doubt, believe. Don't doubt, believe. And so take us from doubt to belief. Belief that this is a new world. Belief that this is a new reality. Belief that there is a better way to be. Belief that the powers and principalities of of evil, hurt, harm, greed, of status. Those don't matter. Your kingdom does, and you invite us to be in it and of it and to be transformed by you. Lord, grant us to move beyond doubt to belief and grant us the tenacity to insist on an experience of you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand and we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together before we go. Let's pray. Our Father.
If you've met someone you didn't know yet this morning, please speak to them before you leave. And if you haven't, then do your best to do so. Have a great week and look forward to seeing you next week.